Okay, so it's a hybrid event. Uh, we've got uh, so about 20 people in the room and we've got lots more people uh, joining us online. Um, uh, my name is Peter Gray. I'm the director of the Institute of Irish Studies uh, here at Queen's University Belfast. Great pleasure for me to welcome you to today's uh, Irish Studies seminar. Uh, and our, our speaker today is, uh, is Dr. Uh, Schieffer Aiken, uh, who is uh, a lecturer in Irish uh, in the Department of Modern Languages uh, uh, here at Queen's University Belfast. Uh, and Schieffer is going to present uh, work uh, today, this afternoon, arising from her forthcoming monograph uh, entitled Spiritual Wounds, Trauma, Testimony and the Irish Civil War, to be published by Irish Academic Press. Uh, very soon, uh, sometime next year. Uh, and this is based on her doctoral dissertation uh, at uh, NUI Galway, which was awarded the Adele Dulcimer Prize uh, by the American Conference for Irish Studies in 2021. So it's great to have uh, 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 Shifra here uh, with us. Um, and uh, she's going to be presenting this afternoon, uh, uh, as I say, on her research. We hope that you can see her slides already. If you can't see those, could, could someone uh, online just let me know? Just unmute yourself and shout out if you can't see the slides. You see them. Great, so that's thanks. <laughs> that's a great relief to, to all of us. Uh, we haven't got any major technical issues. So without further ado, I'm going to pass over uh, to Schieffer, who's going to give a presentation, and then we'll move on to Q&A after that. So. Okay, thanks so much, Peter. Um, so I'd, I'd just like to say thanks very much, first of all, to Peter for the invitation. Um, and I suppose thanks to the Queen's community in general for giving me such a warm welcome. I've just been here since... April, but obviously the first six months were online, so I'm really happy to be on campus um, and being part of the Queen's community. Um, I haven't done one of these events before, so I'll probably be looking at the audience rather <laughs> than the, the, the camera, so I'm not really sure where to look, but I'll probably be looking at the live audience. Um, so my paper today is entitled Uncovering an Alternative Archive of Testimony from the Irish Civil War, and it will be something of a reflection on, um, as Peter said, my um, monograph, which is called Spiritual Wounds, Trauma, Testimony in the Irish Civil War, which builds on my, my doctoral dissertation. Um, and it is in the final stages, I suppose, of, of publication. I, I spent the last few weeks carving up the PDF and scattering it around um, to many people. So I'm really grateful for all the people that helped me out um, in the last year um, to make sure that there isn't any typos in the final manuscript. So hopefully I'll get that far. Um, but essentially, the key overarching argument of the project is that the overemphasis on silence, both in popular discourse and also in academic study, has occluded a wealth of testimony by veterans of the Irish Civil War. And most of these that I've uncovered are from the 1920s and 30s, but also going up to later, up until the 70s, 80s and even 90s. And essentially, the book reintroduces what I've referred to as an alternative archive of narratives by veterans of the Civil War. Um, so in this presentation today, I'll, I'll be touching on a few th themes. Um, and I want to touch, first of all, on that question of trauma, which is in the title, and then to the question of testimony and what, what do I mean by testimony and representation of um, particularly um, representation of traumatic experience. And then the final question I want to look at is the question of reception. So they're kind of the three themes that I'll look at. Um, and I will give some examples as I go through the paper, but rather than focus on specific cases, I'm I would rather give a kind of broader uh, context today. Um, so the first thing to do is just to set up the very broad context of the Civil War. I'm sure many of you are already well familiar with this, but just in case any of you are not, um, the Irish Civil War erupted in May 1922 over the acceptance of the Anglo-Irish Treaty, which granted independence from Britain to the 26 southern counties. And it was fought over the next 11 months between two factions of the IRA, um, the anti-treaty IRA and then the pro-treaty government. And the period of the Civil War witnessed higher levels of violence in the earlier period. There was also high levels of internment, um, some 12,000 anti-treaty activists, high levels of internment of women as well. And there are a number of atrocities that were committed on both sides that resonate, I suppose, in popular imagination, and um, particularly um, the, the month of, ter of terror, as it's referred to, in, in Kerry, um, when, for example, nine anti-treaty act activists were, were tied to a mine, which was then blown up. Um, and in a lot of the discourse, then there is this emphasis on on speakability, on on the the um, level of trauma associated with it, and how that trauma is associated with silence. And I'll just give an example here, which is um, how the war is referred to in the 1950s as the unspeakable war, 
this is the historian and journalist Owen, Owen Neeson writing for um, the Irish Sunday Independent, actually. But we see this uh, emphasis on silence across the board, both leading political parties. They ran election campaigns in the 1930s to heal the war wounds, to get rid of the forgotten Civil War days. For decades, school textbooks, memoirs, history books mysteriously ended with the truce of July in July 1922. Politicians, leading figures, burnt their Civil War papers. Children of revolutionary veterans in particular shared the sense, as Gavin Foster's research suggests, that the whole country seemed to have taken a vow of silence. And we can say this emphasis on silence is even echoed a little bit in the more recent um, decade of centenary programmes, which um, originally was scheduled from 2012 to 2022, which omitted the final year of um, the final six months of the conflict. That has since been extended, but it's nevertheless quite interesting that there was uh, some level of silence even in the, that initial scheduling. Um, and this code of silence built up around the civil, civil war, it's indicative of what's observed internationally and um, this belief that particularly devastating events are followed by extended periods of silence. And we see this in various contexts, whether that's in the Holocaust, after um, genocides, after particularly uh, difficult events. And I would argue that this silence is even more pertinent post-Civil War, because there is this emphasis on reconciliation and emphasis on forgetting the past um, in order to, to move forward, I suppose. But essentially what my argument here is that the emphasis on silence, even though this is what, what prevails in, in much popular understanding and literary and historical study, that what we see is there's actually um, a paradox here in that this is actually a highly vocal silence. And it does speak to what Guy Biner refers to in, um, in the introduction of his latest book, and that's the paradox of intentional forgetting. That's the idea that these calls to forget and these calls for silence effectively ensure that the event supposedly condemned to oblivion will be remembered in an obscure form. And I think that's what, what I've uncovered here. Um, and it also speaks in general to the paradox of traumatic silence, because even though trauma may be associated with silence, um, trauma tears such as Ro Roger Luckhurst and others and psychologists, um, suggest the fact that those who live through traumatic events often carry an urge to tell about that experience rather than um, an urge to forget about it. And I suppose this, that those dynamics are central to the entire book. It's that idea of this urge to tell and how the urge to tell is balanced with maybe a desire to forget. Um, so I've put together all of these um, testimonies, um, but what I have looked at is I'm, I'm not just looking at first-hand testimonies, I'm also looking at fictionalized testimonies, not something we'll come back to um, in terms of the aesthetics. Um, and one of the most striking features, I think, of the whole project is the fact that so much of this material has been overlooked in scholarship to date. And it's it's really quite remarkable. Um, many have never been addressed at all. Others have been referenced in merely a fleeting reference or two. Um, so I suppose the wealth of this body of testimony um, suggests that the silence of the Civil War was not necessarily a result of revolutionaries' reluctance to speak, to, to speak, sorry, but rather due to the unwillingness of politicians, of journalists, of historians to listen to the testimony that was actually um, put out there. Um, so as much as the book recovers these testimonies, it also maps why these writings have been subject to both um, social and cultural forgetting. And I, I would just use um, Guy Biner's definition from his forthcoming book on the pandemic um, pandemic reawakenings um, relating to social and cultural forgetting that these testimonies have been, I suppose, occluded from scholarship due to these constructions of myths of silence, active silencing of revolutionaries to, through canon formation, which is quite interesting. There are cases of censorship, excommunication, and also the self-censorship of revolutionaries themselves. So there are all of these processes that come up throughout the book. Um, and just before I move on to any more of the testimonies, I suppose part of the whole question of the alternative archive um, and something I've been thinking about more recently does come from my background as someone who works in languages, but particularly who's working in a, a department which is in the Irish language department in a minoritized language. Um, and I suppose I would have started working on this aware that there was this body of Irish language which really made its way into mainstream scholarship. Um, and it's also something that I find myself doing again and again. Um, whether intentionally or not, but um, for example, my students in level three this semester were also tasked with putting together alternative archives and material in a migration studies module where they're putting together material about um, the migration experience of Irish speakers, looking at material that wouldn't necessarily be looked at usually, whether that's folklore material and oral collections and so on. So I suppose it's already part of what I would be doing in terms of an Irish language context, looking at what's been left out of the mainstream narratives. 
Um, then in terms of the, the um, book itself, it's, it's divided into its five main themes. I'll just say very quickly what some of these themes are, and then I'll move on to the three main um, areas that I want to explore. Um, but the, the uh, chapter one and chapter two look at contemporary understanding of narrative therapy among male and female re revolutionaries. Um, and I'm really interested in this idea of what could be referred to as script of therapy or the idea of writing through experience. But I'm more interested in how this was something that was written about at the time and what, what revolutionaries felt narrative could convey. Um, and there's a quote there, rid ridding ourselves of the past, which is by Desmond Ryan and his um, ideas of why uh, revolutionaries should acknowledge and write about the Civil War. Um, Chapter three then participates in more recent debates regarding sexual violence. And I know Marie Coven is here and many other scholars, I think, who are signed in who have been working on this. Linda Connolly has been very um, central in bringing this to the, to the fore. Um, but this, I suppose, looks at this from a different perspective and it complicates the belief that revolutionary sexual violence um, was a hidden crime. It's looking at the fact that actually, if we look at all this popular material, um, sexual violence proliferates in this material published in the 1920s and 30s and particularly looking at fictionalized accounts by revolutionaries themselves and there's implied and explicit representations of hair shearing, sexual humiliations, gender specific torture, rape, domestic violence and also sexual violence against men um, and I suppose what I'm arguing here is that these popular narratives are not necessarily evidence that such events occurred but they nevertheless form part of these discourses that regulate the reporting and the remembering of sexual violence and um, that they are as necessary in understanding this question as any archival studies of the pension files of compensation claims or court, court proceedings. Um, and what's interesting too is that even though some of these writings were banned, I, I'm thinking for, of an example by Liam O'Flaherty, his Civil War novel, the majority of these weren't. Um, so I think that also contests the, the emphasis, I suppose, on sexual prudery in the early years of the um, Irish Free State, that actually a lot of this entered um, mainstream discourse and it, they were also read. And that question of both writing and, and reading is something that comes up again and again. How do, are these, how were these received at the time is nearly as important as what motivated how, how they were written. Um, chapter four then is one that I might get to talk about a little bit, depending on time, but addresses the dynamics of inner and external exile in emigrant testimonies. And what I've done here is I've borrowed from Paul Eel's concept in the, in the Spanish Civil War, that idea of both inner exile as well as exile through emigration. Um, and then chapter five complicates the belief that veterans of the Civil War were silent regarding their role in perpetrating violence and looks at, I suppose, revolutionary violence through a different lens rather than looking at revolutionary violence through restraint as maybe has been and promotion in historical study. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the fact that if we look at these popular narratives, violence is often described in excess. Um, and I'm particularly interested in the, the uh, strategies evident in perpetrator testimony in order to enable confessions of perpetrating violence. And two of the key testimonies that I addressed are produced in the 1970s um, in response to the outbreak of violence during the Troubles. And both appear in these non non-conventional forms. One appears in a, a hybridized memoir form and the second appears in the form of a novel. So I'm, I'm really intrigued um, in terms of why are, why these narrative strategies were maybe helpful for addressing so, and confessing, I suppose, to perpetrating violence. Um, so what I'll do now is I'll move on to those three themes that I um, mentioned. So trauma, um, representation and the Civil War aesthetic and then testimonial reception. And I will give it some detail on um, the case of two veterans that I've included in the study, and they're the writings of Cork O'Horan and his wife, Eileen Dolan, both who were imprisoned during the Civil War. And I've chosen these today because they have a strong Belfast connection. So that's why I thought I'd start with um, O'Horan and, and Dolan. Um, but first of all, we'll, we'll address the question, question of trauma, I suppose. Um, so what's interesting here is that the Irish Civil War is popularly associated with trauma. There's actually even a hashtag, Twitter hashtag, Irish Civil War trauma. But despite that, there's remarkably little study, I think, of um, the, that sense of trauma popularly associated with, associated with the Civil War. The scholars that we might think of are Anne Dolan's study and then more recently Gavin Foster's work. And we might think of that neglect as maybe um, indicative of the 
the um, I suppose the ambivalence towards popular culture in historical study and the emphasis on scientific approaches within uh, which underpins much historical study. And what I'm interested in doing here is slightly in the introduction of the book, slightly changing from the emphasis on violence, what actually happened to looking at how historical memory and particularly traumatic memory was constructed. Um, and this ties into um, theories of collective trauma, cultural trauma, which all emphasize the fact that um, events do not necessarily become traumatic in and of themselves, that trauma is socially, it's a socially mediated um, attribution. It's something that's constructed. Um, and this is something that happens in different stages. It happens at the time. So if we look at diaries that are written in 1922 and 1923, we can see that the language of wounding, the language of nerves, the language of anxiety appears. We also see that subsequently, and we see then the language of trauma, the word trauma starts to come in the 1960s, and we can see it in the titles of memoirs. George Lennon refers to his memoirs, uh, Trauma and Time. Sean O'Fallon starts to use the language of trauma in the 1960s in relation to the Civil War, but it wasn't existent previous to that, but we have wounding and psychological wounding. Um, but the other interesting part is that it also happens before the Irish Civil War actually occurred. Um, and this ties into what Guy Viner refers to as pre-memory, that's to say that events are remembered and assimilated according to memories of previous events. And I think this is particularly pertinent in the context of civil wars. Um, David Armitage, for example, in his study, Civil War as a History of Ideas, suggests that such a dynamic is key to understanding civil war because civil war is both a historical and cumulative concept. That is that whenever the spectre of civil war arose, it did so in forms that recalled previous conflicts. Um, and when we actually look at the material, even in, from local newspapers from early 1922, we see the language of unspeakability is circulating before hostilities actually broke out. And if we go back earlier to the 1910s, again, we see the language of unspeakability being associated with civil war before anything actually happened. And um, so I think that's something that slightly shifts um, the idea of how we might approach um, questions of trauma. And I suppose if we say the Irish Civil War was imagined as uniquely devastating and as traumatic before it even happened, then there's a whole question of how can we restrict the traumatic memory to the, of the Civil War to the official chronology of May 22 until um, April 23. Um, and as a result, the book is also about the many unacknowledged civil wars that occurred during this period, to use Peter Hart's um, term. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking of this in a, in a broader context. Peter Hart referred to this uh, unacknowledged civil war in terms of the execution of um, spies by the IRA. I'm looking at that in other contexts as well, such as um, execution of RIC officers, sexual violence perpetrated by the IRA against women, family civil war splits, that there are all of these unacknowledged civil wars. Um, and that within the, the memory of the civil war, that the, the time scales are often blurring, that it doesn't necessarily fit from 1922 to 1923. And um, so that's the, the kind of broader ideas of trauma and traumatic memory. But then there was another whole question that I had to approach, and that was the idea of understanding trauma in the context. Um, and there is a tendency maybe to think of trauma through the lens of PTSD, which was um, only became a diagnosis in 1980. So there's a question there too of historicizing trauma and looking at how this actually was understood at the time. So I would have started off um, by looking through the pension files, by looking through the language in, in contemporary memoirs, looking at how trauma was understood in the context of post-World War One, what kind of ideas were circulating in Ireland, and um, the fact that Freud Freudian ideas of the subconscious had been translated to English, that these were circulating, but also that revolutionaries were understanding these concepts through to a, an array of different ideas, whether that was through religious ideas and um, supernatural ideas, um, as well as emerging psycho, psychoanalysis. Um, and um, there's just a few examples here. Um, this is actually from um, a forthcoming book that um, Marie Coleman here edited um, with Paul Bew and Kuivinik um, Gudave. Um, which I, I was delighted to be involved in. But we can see here, and um, this was more in the context of um, Belfast, but we can see here that it, there's actually uh, remedies being uh, created in um, in Belfast to, to um, deal with shell shock and neurasthenia. Um, but also I'm interested in the gender dynamics of how trauma is perceived. And we can see that in the image here that we have the idea of revitalization and cure from trauma is seen as very much a process of remasculization. Um, and equally, the gender dimensions of trauma are very apparent in the treatment of um, both male and female revolutionary veterans. 
and this is something that I started off with a few years ago and I'm still looking at, but it's really quite fascinating. And the most strong example of this is a case in Dublin where we have Dr. Robert Farnan, who is strongly connected with Eamon de Valera. And um, in account that Siobhan Langford wrote, she writes that she went to seek treatment from him for her exhausted nerves um, at the aftermath of the Civil War. And she was prescribed a rest-based treatment of about up to six months rest at a removal from the strain of the conflict. And she actually went to Malahide to take a break. Um, but then we find in the Bureau statements that Dr. Farnan was known to treat um, the men that were in Michael Collins's squad with some kind of for form of talk therapy. He was known to treat the men by merely speaking to them. So what we have there is a very gender specific nature of treatment. I'm not saying that that's necessarily true across the board, but we have a very, very strong example here. And the more I've looked into it, the more examples I've found that actually do support that, although I'm sure there are exceptions as well. Um, and one of the most striking, I suppose, um, insights into the gendered nature of of understanding trauma at the time is the fact that um, the pensions board had a policy of sending women who were claiming for nervous exhaustion or nervous conditions, they had a policy of sending them for gynecological testing. So I think that really underscores again that idea. And I should have mentioned too that Dr. Farnan was actually known as a ladies doctor. He was a gynecologist. And it's very interesting that then he was treating both men and women for um, nervous conditions. Um, so that's the question of trauma. And that kind of comes through Again and again in the narratives, I'm interested in how revolutionaries address these emerging ideas, how rest therapies, how psychoanalysis are addressed in their writings, and also those ideas of um, trauma and how this also, um, the, this taboo around trauma, I suppose, also reflects the, the um, emergence of these more rigid gender norms in which are part of, I suppose, the Irish National Project. And we do find that, for example, the military um, service pensions board were much more reluctant to acknowledge questions of psychological distress than um, pension board or uh, compensation boards, for example, in Britain. And um, so it, this is part of the reason, I suppose, that there is a certain taboo around this. Um, so I'm going to move on now to representation. Um, so what I, what I suggest throughout is that um, even do, though ideas and understanding of trauma is always in flux as well, throughout these decades that are treated um, understandings of trauma are, are developing all the time. But what I suggest from this book is what doesn't change is this desire or this urge to tell about experience that many veterans hold. That's not to say that all veterans wanted to testify about their experience, but the, 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 the narratives in the book very much um, bear witness to that, to that desire to tell about one's personal experience and often a desire to re return and address that experience again and again throughout their lives. Um, and this again ties to psychological um, studies about this idea of the imperative to, to tell and to be heard. Um, but what I've um, uncovered is that a, a lot of the testimony here is found in accounts and stories that blur narrative genres. Um, so they're found in places that maybe historians don't look traditionally in seemingly artist fictionalized writing, in realistic autobiographically based fiction and drama buried under the artifice of poetry hidden in, in Gothic or romance modes. Um, and what I've actually said in one of the key arguments is that literary testimonies of the Irish Civil War far outweighed the straight up first hand narratives. And I think if we look at women's accounts, that's particularly pertinent. Um, by the end of the 1930s, there was only really one straight up autobiography about the Civil War. That was Margaret Buckley's um, jail journal. But if we look at all of the accounts by female revolutionaries about their experience hidden through these fictional accounts, we see that there was actually a lot more um, that got through these non-conventional forms. Um, but this was also something that was observed at the, at the time. It's hinted at in Francis Flanagan's most recent um, study, Remembering the Revolution. But as I said, it was something that was, was observed at the time. And um, so th this is just a quote from Desmond Ryan's um, biography of Eamon de Valera from 1936. And he outlines and identifies the three narratives that in, in his view most expressly capture the spiritual wounds of civil war. And that's where I've taken the title for the book. And those three narratives are The Gates Were Open by Father O'Donnell, which many of you will be familiar with. But the second two, Francis Carthy's Allegiance the Rearguard and Patrick Malloy's Jacket Screen, they're both novels that are written from the perspective, first of all, for Francis Carthy, who was an anti-treaty IRA activist, and um, Patrick Malloy, who was in the Free State Army. Um, and these are autobiographically based novels based on their experience that to date haven't been incorporated in, into any study. And they, they're given quite a lot of treatment in this, but really, really remarkable testimonies. And this was something that was acknowledged at the time 
Um, in terms of this idea of a civil war aesthetic and the literary nature of these writings, it's also part of civil war writing internationally. And um, so I just have a bit of that here on the slide, but um, civil war is often evoked due to, I suppose, the contentious nature of civil war. It's often evoked by using these tropes, whether it's the brother against brother trope, whether it's the love triangle. Um, and we see this in the Spanish civil war. We also have a quote here from Nicholas McDowell, that it's emerging from the Roman tradition, whether or not protagonists were fully aware of that tradition. And these tropes and motifs occur again and again. Um, one of the writings included, for example, is Marie Negrada's remarkable short story collection called Unverts Jahar, Shkiltiela, The Two Brothers and Other Stories, which is a civil war collection that's evoked in the title um, of the collection, even though when we read the stories, the, 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 um, the years blur a little bit. Um, so we can look at this phenomenon, this phenomenon of the fictionalized writings um, through the prism of more recent scholarship in trauma studies and in life writing, which looks at the fact that when individuals want to write about traumatic experience, they'll often swerve from the conventions of standard autobiography. But uh, what I've argued here, too, is it was actually indicative of the um, narrative practice of the period in the post-World War One period, that these were the texts um, that writers were, um, and readers were being exposed to from the First World War. Um, and if we look to the French case, for example, and um, we can see that similarly, and many of the accounts from the First World War are written in these fictionalized um, writings. All Quiet on the Western Front will be one example that's referred to. Um, and the other thing, just to mention before I move on to examples, is that I'm looking here not um, at, I suppose I'm looking at popular narratives, and even that is something of a break from the emphasis in trauma studies on modernist fragmentation associated um, with trauma. But what I'm seeing here is that a lot of these texts are not necessarily um, experimental in their aesthetic, that they're in safely non-experimental texts in middle-brow, low-brow, even sub-literary writings. Um, but that's where the material is. So that, again, is, is slightly um, moving away from um, the emphasis on modernist fragmentation in, in, in trauma studies more generally. So I'll give just... Um, a few examples of this, and that's um, Pork O'Horan and Eileen Dolan. Um, and the reason I've picked um, this case is because, first of all, I said there is a strong Belfast connection, um, which is quite interesting. But the, these, these, um, this, I suppose, sums up this idea of the urge to tell and the desire to process experience. Um, both um, Pork O'Horan and Eileen Dolan reflected on the fact that their writing was part of a therapeutic project of writing. Mm -hmm. um, Dolan said that writing was a form of escapism and a vehicle for recovery, while Porco Horan hinted at his personal urge to tell of the futility of the revolutionary project. In terms of their um, background, so Porco Horan and Eileen Dolan, um, they, they married in the 1920s, but they were both Civil War internees. Um, O'Horan was from city centre Dublin and he was active in the anti-treaty IRA. He would have been too young to be involved in 1916 and was probably part of that generation who felt that they'd missed out in 1916 and then joined um, the anti-treaty IRA as soon as the four courts were bombarded. And really only was in active for a number of days before he was in turn and spent um, the next year and a half, um, or he was arrested, sorry, um, so he was only active for a number of days before he was arrested and then he was interned until Christmas 1923. And then Dolan also was interned um, in a slightly different situation. She she was interned after um, guns were found in her family home by the Free State Army that had actually been concealed by her mother. Um, and she was from Stony Batter. And she was only 15 at the time when she was interned for six months. And there's, there's a, um, a tension in her writing in that she wasn't necessarily active herself. It was the mother who was active. And, and we see that she's very apprehensive, therefore, of the national project later on. Um, following that experience. But what's interesting here is that O'Horan grew so dismayed because of his Civil War experience. He was particularly dismayed with the Republican leadership, who he felt um, allowed younger activists like himself to be put placed in the line of fire. And he was also particularly dismayed at the Catholic Church for their abandonment in his view of the um, anti-treaty IRA. So when he re was released from internment, he found what he referred to as a new spiritual home in the Dublin Methodist Mission. Um, and he was hoping to find Ireland's healing and the sweet and blessed truth. So he left Ireland to study at Cliff Methodist College in Dublin before moving to Belfast, where he trained at the Methodist Ministry at Edgewell Theological 
college. And then Eileen Dolan also joined him in Belfast and converted to Methodism. Um, so I'll, I'll just reflect on some of their, their writings because this is not a, a typical, um, I suppose, uh, case. But what's interesting here is that both of them address the civil war again and again and again in very different modes and, and from different perspectives. Um, and in the book, I've, lo I've looked at both of their works to particularly look at questions of exile, how both of them perceive themselves to be exiles and use the language of exile. But their exile is not just about geographic displacement. It's also a, a, an inner state. And there's various layers of inner exile as well as emigration and dislocation and um, uh, and displacement. Um, and how they, they approach this quite differently from a, a male and female perspective. So I'll just say, first of all, what did O'Horan do in terms of his writing? Um, because this just shows how these testimonies, there are so many. So the first thing to say is, even when he was imprisoned in Gormanstown, he was writing poetry that was being smuggled out and published in the Sunday Independent, testifying to his experience, both in Irish and English, and there's an example there on the slide. He then um, published a poetry collection in 1924 called Eyes of My Love, which is all this romance poetry, but I've argued that he could read it as an extended metaphor for the trials and tribulations of his Civil War internment. Um, but he then went on in 1923 and he published his anti-hunger strike diary, as I've referred to it, in the Methodist magazine in London, which was his um, experience in Gormstown refusing to participate in the hunger strike of October 1923. Um, and then he had published an extended fictionalised account of the Civil War experience, which was uh, serialised over a year in the Irish Christian Advocate, Advocate which was um, Belfast Basin. And um, it's, it's held here in the in the archive in Lennoxville. Um, so we have all of these testimonies to his, his experience. Um, he then went on to write poetry. He wrote over, I think it was five poetry collections. Um, and what we see is how he connects his sense of exile to various traditions. He looks at the nationalist tradition. Um, he looks at the poetry of Ethnic Carberry. He then looks at the um, wild geese tradition. He then looks at the Gaelic exile of St. Patrick and St. Colin Quill. So he's looking at placing himself in, in, in as an exile in line with all of these <clears> tropes. <throat> um, and then his fictionalized writings also owe a great debt to Sean O'Casey. So one of the other arguments is how these testimonies interact with the fiction that these readers were writing. And particularly in the in the fictionalized testimony, he's looking to testify on behalf of the tenement, the dwellers of the tenements in Dublin during the Civil War, how Civil War invaded life in the tenements. Um, and particularly asking the question of what did this really do? What was the revolutionary do, do, revolution doing for these everyday people in the tenements? And as well addressing the, um, the oh, tensions actually between Belfast refugees and then the dwellers of Dublin tenements during the Civil War, something that maybe is not um, addressed um, as often elsewhere. So that was O'Horan's body of testimony. We look at Dolan's now, but just to look at how many times he's coming back and back um, to his Civil War experience. So Dolan wrote two successful religious conversion memoirs. So these are essentially accounts of her Civil War and her arrest during the Civil War, her six month imprisonment and how this um, led to her um, conversion to Methodism. The first one is 1932, The Gates of Babylon, the story of a conversion. And the second one is No More Foreigners, Impressions of a Spiritual Pil Pilgrim. Um, and then she went on to hint at her experience of exile in her many short stories and novels. And one of the dominant themes running through her fiction is the idea of return migration to Ireland. Um, and the writings also emphasize um, and also are often motivated to this idea of undoing exile. Um, in terms of her work, then she, um, as I said, published two memoirs. She then wrote numerous short stories um, and they're in different um, different uh, journals, The Bell, for example, and um, the Catholic magazine, which was in um, the States, Chambers Journal, which was in the UK, I think it was in London. Um, and what we find with a lot of the, the women's writings is that their writings can be um, quite different depending on the audiences that they're writing for. And particularly with Dolan, we find that um, some of her writings are highly subversive, while others are quite conformist, and um, which is something that comes through again and again. And then she went on to be a best-selling romance novelist um, and was referred to as the Mary Stuart of um, Ireland, even though she hasn't been addressed to date at all. Um, but what um, I suppose I, I want, want to get at, get at here is that 
this was again a way of her writing through her experience and um, there's a quote here which is about remembering the revolution from london and um, which is inserted in one of her uh, short stories but based on all our memoirs we know that this is actually she's writing from her her own experience also and um, and what she also does is uses romance narratives in significant ways and this comes up again and again I, i've argued elsewhere in the book that romance was a powerful vehicle and particularly heartbreak the emotions of heartbreak were a power, powerful vehicle both in first-hand and fictionalized testimonies as a way to hint at the experience of personal trauma i suppose in a society where emotion was often repressed particularly actually for men that the, the heartbreak of um romance was often referred to uh, love triangles are often employ also employed very widely in civil war narratives again for a similar function and um, but what dolan does is quite interesting in that um her dilemma of return migration that she's looking at again and again and it might speak to her own dilemma of returning and possibly reintegrating with her family her 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 family essentially disowned her when she converted to methodism and that was obviously something that she she had um to grapple with um but a huge number of her stories then uh, relate to romance between returning economic emigrants and residences, residents of b- the big houses. So what she's, b- b- I suppose, doing quite literally is she's marrying the plight of the dispossessed Catholic uh, Catholics with that of the declining Protestant ascendancy. So we have this want for reconciliation that's coming through in these romance narratives uh, throughout her work, which is quite interesting. And she returned to Ireland and then later on, and um, which I didn't get, won't get to look at here, went on to, to write plays as well uh, about Countess Markievicz and Eva Gorbut. So again, actually looking at addressing the revolutionary period in fiction um, and particularly looking at women's experiences and rewriting that, not through her own experience, but through those who were imprisoned with her. Um, so I'll move on from that because there's a lot more I could say about O'Hor and, and, and Dolan, but that's just to give a snippet, I suppose, of the, these narratives because um, O'Horan and Dolan haven't been addressed really in, in scholarship to date except for um, an essay that, and this is how I suppose I came across it, um, um, and that was um, in, in uh, the name is, has gone for me just now, I'll come, I'll come back to that. But um, the, the, I suppose that the, it, it shows, I suppose, that the fact that there's all this testimony in different narrative forms and um, that it's both poetry it's both firsthand it's also then fictionalized um, and it's been returning to again and again and um, throughout their, their um, life experiences and then also that they're they, these are occurring in places where you may not traditionally think in, in these maybe somewhat obscure literary journals and also magazines um, and to date they haven't been addressed the only scholarship on Eile Dolan is related to her her novels, which were published under the name Elizabeth Brennan much later. She was very successful in her novels, but the only uh, account that I've come across about her works um, actually mistakes her for another writer called Elizabeth Brennan. So we have this article about two different Elizabeth Brennans, but they're not the same Elizabeth Brennan. Um, And that just points to women's writings as well, that she was writing under different names. And I imagine she was writing under other names, other pseudonyms that I haven't been able to uncover, but she does hint to to that in some of her writings. Um, So... What does that bring up? What question, I suppose, does that bring up in terms of reception? Um, and that's really the last point I want to, to get at, because there's the question of how were so many of these writings neglected, I suppose, from historical study and, and literary um, scholarship. But at the same time, these testimonies, they weren't, um, it's not that they weren't read in their own time. I think that's something to, to think of. That Elizabeth Brennan, for example, was a best-selling novelist. When I referred to um, Patrick Malloy and um, Francis Carthy, they were serialised. Francis Carthy's works were serialised in the Irish press. These were widely read. Um, other novels similarly were making the bestseller list at the time. Um, so these were, were, were widely um, appreciated at the time. And I suppose that this would um, suggest that there was this counter memory that was being generated. Um, and there's uh, two ways of looking at this. Uh, um, Guy Biner has drawn attention to um, the question of social interaction of memory and um, study of um, collective memory by Mars Halsbach, the idea that memory demands social interactions. And if we think of all of these re- interactions, we see that there was this counter memory that was being generated. And what I've tried to do in the book throughout is to look at how these were read and what was 
how are readers responding to these works and how did this um, allow for a counter memory, I suppose, in the shadow of um, a reticence at official level that they live worked side by side. And um, in another sense, the emphasis on who was receiving these testimonies is necessary when we think of what testimony is in general. And um, so testimony is different from a personal story. A personal story is something that's written. Testimony is as person as personal story that's written to be shared, that is put into the public sphere. Um, and my definition of testimony, obviously there, there may be other definitions, but it's a my definition is a, any account that testifies to a personal experience in any form and um, that sets out to make a statement or contest a silence. Um, and I think that that's how these writings all fit that model of testimony, even though they fit into different genres, that they're writing from personal um, experience and setting out to maybe set the record straight or set, set um, um, to contest a silence. Um, and the, the writings, I suppose, the fact that they've they've been omitted and um, suggests uh, they've been slipping through, I suppose, disciplinary cracks of, of literary and historical analysis. And I would say that maybe literary and scholarship hasn't sufficiently addressed middlebrow fiction, subliterary fiction, that there's still a focus on the literature of the canon, while in historical studies, the um, phenomenon <coughs> of fictionalized testimony has um, all but been overlooked. So there, there is a case here that so much of this material is slipping through disciplinary cracks. Um, so to, that brings us, I suppose, to another question, and that's the question of um, my own implications in testimony, because if we're talking about reception and reception being critical to the, these testimonies and how we are received, um, I've also brought up the question in the in, in conclusion or in the, the final chapter, and that's um, the question of what, what is the role of the researcher as an active witness? albeit at a historical remove. And this is something that I felt needed to be addressed because um, I suppose there is often an emphasis on, on the detachment of, of the researcher in so many so many um, historical study. But I would say that working with this kind of material is something that brought up all sorts of effective experience on settling encounters, that some of this material is was difficult to, to receive or difficult to handle. And I felt that I needed to acknowledge and my own implications and where I was in, in this in terms of um, receiving th these works. Um, and in terms of, I suppose, the field of Irish studies, this is something that maybe I was challenged to do because of the work of Emily Pine, the, 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 the writers that are, are looking at breaking down this emphasis on the detachment of the researcher. Um, and that was something I probably struggled to, to write, but I felt that it was necessary um, to, to grapple with that question of where does the researcher fit in, in as, as a active witness, albeit at a historical um, remove. And um, in another sense, this was even more necessary for me because I do have a family connection, like a lot of, I think, historical historians working on the revolution. I don't think I'm, I'm exceptional in that. But as I mentioned earlier, um, the emphasis on silence is often supported by the fact that leading Civil War veterans on both sides destroyed their Civil War papers. I'm obviously Um, wrote his biography of Michael Collins. He referred to it as an act of reparation in the introduction that he was writing um, this biography of Collins. And I've said that in the, in the conclusion of this book, that this book in its own way is its own re act of rep reparation as a response to that destruction of historical material. Um, and I think in another sense, the focus on the implications of the researcher, how to use Michael Rothberg the researcher is an implicated subject. I think that's also necessary in just by virtue of the fact that most of the more recent historical debates have been very subjective, um, yet the subjectivity of the researcher hasn't been put to the fore yet. If we think of ethical remembrance as a concept, it's ethical remembrance according to who and how is the researcher subjective in that. Um, equally, decolonizing the curriculum um, could be benefit, I suppose, from an idea and um, I suppose attention to the positionalities of the research, research when approaching these topics. Um, so that's how it comes to the end, I suppose, in terms of reception as well as my own, my own reception and involvement. Um, so just, um, I'll just refer to two more things here. Um, where to next? Um, so the project, I think, 
could have gone in a lot of other ways. There's a lot of testimonies and a lot of writings that I couldn't cover by virtue of the, the word limit. Um, but I am interested in also more recently expanding the time frame and actually looking at the memory of the Civil War, War, War right into 2020. So one of the things uh, they did a few months ago was actually do up a list of all of the writings, particularly popular historical novels that had been published over the last hundred years. And what's really remarkable is that nearly every decade had another um, small archive of Civil War writing being published, yet every time there was new Civil War historical novels being published, they were celebrated as the first account that's grappled with the Civil War. So this is an interesting phenomenon there and an intrigue that there are all of these silence breakers that maybe aren't in um, conversation with each other. Um, and what we find here is that the silence associated with the Civil War is paradoxically uh, very, very generative, that it's producing all of this material in order to break and address the silence, which is quite interesting. And that, I think that's something that I'd like to look at further. And I have been looking at it um, up into more current time. And then the other thing that I've been doing is looking at multilingual um, comparatives, and um, particularly in the Spanish context. And I'm lucky to be working, I suppose, in a modern language department at the moment. But a lot of these um, aesthetics are also evident in other civil war contexts. And I think there's a lot of scope there for a, a much more broader international um, scholarship. But I've been reading the testimonies of um, veterans of the Spanish Civil War, and particularly women. And we have Donia, um, Juana Donia there, which is a novella testimonial, again, a testimonial novel, um, and a, a similar case in the second case. So these kind of um, <coughs> unusual, non-conventional narrative forms are not singular, I think, to, to the Irish case. And there's a lot more, I suppose, research to be done in the future in terms of looking at how this might apply to other contexts. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks very much for listening. And I'm really looking forward to any questions you might have. Thank you so much for that, that wonderful and really stimulating um, presentation. Um, so let's just see if we can find our... Guys, they're ready to ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but before we do that, let's just lose the slides if we can. Okay, so I think... Um, we're back again, just going to put the camera where it should be. Uh, <laughs> great. OK, so uh, we have as I say, people in the room and uh, people online as well. So if you're using Teams and you want to ask a question, what you need to do is just press the button on your screen that has the uh, little hand and face icon and then press the hand icon and that will just uh, digitally raise your hand um, as if you were present with us. Uh, and then I'll ask you just to unmute yourself and to ask your question. Um, so similarly, people in the room, you just you don't need to bother with all of that. Just raise your hand and, and ask away. Um, so let's throw it open uh, for the questions. Uh, who wants to make a start, either online or in person? Ian? No, no, we're gone. Oh, Guy. Um, well, I can see uh, uh, Guy's wait, shaking his head. Uh, Michael McAleer. Uh, so Michael, over to you. Go ahead. So we can't hear you, Michael, so you might just need to unmute yourself. If you're there. So we can't, we can't hear you, Michael, if you have a question. No. Disappeared. OK, anybody, anybody else? Yes, go ahead. Uh -huh. Um, yeah, so um, I, I, so I have looked at the question of women testifying to gender based violence and sexual assault and, and what I've been looking at is the fact that there aren't a huge number of first hand testimonies and that what I've found is there's an interesting phenomenon of disclaimers of not being badly treated actually coming up in um, in testimonies and I, I don't have any solution for that but I think that's an interesting phenomenon um, that I've uncovered anyway and I've also looked at the, there's a downplaying in some of the first-hand testimonies of 
um, both sexualized violence and also of militancy in, in some of these accounts. So the testimonies that I've looked at, particularly in chapter two in the women's testimonies, they are about the civil war experience um, and they're in, in different forms. So an example will be um, Annie P. Smithson, who was in Common Oman, who wrote a novel in 1936, The Marriage of Nurse Harding. And there's a whole section of that, which is basically her civil war experience as a civil war nurse, and then um, also um, briefly interned as well. So I suppose that's her experience as an activist and how it was in her fiction that she was able to, to, to introduce that, I suppose, into the public sphere and then in later writings, when she did write an autobiography later, she refers her readers back to her novel um, and really her novel and her autobiography are almost identical, even in terms of the language that she's using. And um, so there's a few more examples of that in terms of um, these writings that are essentially about civil war experience. But at the same time, they're not grappling directly with some of maybe the more contentious aspects of their um, revolutionary activism. Maureen Cregan has a really remarkable play, which is about a housewife experiencing the hunger strike of her husband, who's taken part in the, the, the mass hunger strike of October 1923, dedicated to her husband, who was on the hunger strike. So obviously it's a reflection on her experience. But it's interesting that when we actually look at what she was doing, she was actually um, uh, currying careering messages across Europe as well during the Civil War and um, working for anti-treaty Sinn Féin. But she doesn't write about that. She's writing it about it in a more conformist sense. So what I've looked at is the fact that even though there's all this subversion in the women's writings, there's also a lot of conformism. And um, but nevertheless, fiction was a genre that allowed them to testify to experience where they couldn't necessarily testify in first person. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, Aidan, we can see you've got your hands full, but you also have your hand up. So if you want to go ahead and ask a question. Sure. I just have a, a kind of a general question about this idea of like the comparative history of, of sort of memory and trauma and, and things that get forgotten. And I know you mentioned the Spanish Civil War quite a bit, but um, have you looked at all at the American Civil War, which does a very similar thing, like very consciously during like in the period of Reconstruction of basically forgetting what the war was actually even about um, and very consciously is done to kind of unify northern and southern white Americans um, and, and kind of consciously excludes African Americans then. Yeah, no, thanks, Aidan. I can't say I've done a huge amount on the, this um, American Civil War. I, I suppose I, I've read some of the, the major accounts and I know there's an um, interesting study on, on sexual violence in the American Civil War and how sexual violence until recently it was seen to be, the American Civil War was seen to be a low rape war until recently and that's, some, that's something that's been since contested. So I can't say that the American Civil War is one that I've read on extensively. So I'll have to read, I, I suppose I can, I'll have to make the confession that um. My undergrad was in Spanish, so I, I tend to read a lot of the, the Spanish material, but um, I'm sure there are a lot more comparisons that can be done there. OK, thanks, Aidan. Uh, other questions online or in person? Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, I have a question for you. Two questions, actually. First one, how long does the literary voice continue memory of people my second question is, uh, do you have a social group that moves outside of the immediate region of the conflict and reflect back on the experience, but beyond the region of Ireland? Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, Gurmeet has a Um. So in terms of the creative writing, um, what I've looked at in the, the book is mainly the 1930s, 1920s as well, but the, the 1930s coming up until the 1940s, but it's 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 mostly in the 1930s, but then it does continue nevertheless, and there seems to be another maybe um, renewal of writing from the later 60s, and I mentioned there um, that some really remarkable work published in the 70s, but then there is also some works that are published as late as the 90s. I'm thinking Francis Stewart's, um, he only gets a brief mention, but he's about three different Civil War novels too, or in the 30s. And I think, I think either it's 1990 that he died, so I think it might have been in the 1980s that his, his final uh, work was produced. And um, so one of the arguments is that th this imperative to need him to be heard is a lifelong task. And um, Francis Carthy, who I mentioned there uh, earlier, he was still writing an unpublished novel when he died, for example, 
Um, so there, there is this continuation. The one thing that I do say in the argument I make is that the women are less likely to come back to the experience again and again. And there's more obstacles to getting their work heard, to having an audience. And then of, let's say, Marie Negro, the um, Maureen Cregan, who I have looked at, their earlier writings are the more political writings about the revolution. And we find then that they move away from those topics in later writings. And then the question, the second question was, um, just to get this right, was it outside yeah, of Ireland? Rights, obviously, or they don't live in Ireland. Yeah, no, um, you know, that's something um, I would love to do. So I have a small collection. There's a, a really, I, I don't know if I can remember the name off the top of my head, but there was a French novelist who wrote a number of um, uh, a Civil War novel called L'Holocast. And um, she later was um, a supporter of the, the Nazis in the Second World War. So there's a lot of, a lot to be unpacked in that. But she um, actually had never came to Ireland, but she corresponded with a number of um, leading uh, revolutionaries in order to, to, to grapple with that. So there is that sense. And then there's another um, case um, that a writer called N Nils Peterson. Um, and I'm trying to remember, I, no, he was Norwegian, I think, who lived in Ireland, who wrote a novel in, Nor in Norwegian that was then translated to English about the Civil War. And he was very anti um, the anti-treaty IRA. And that was how he addressed it in, in the, um, the the works. So they don't appear. And that's something that, you know, there, there is scope for that. And um, really, because there's so much material, I was focusing on the material written by those who were actually active. But there's, I think that there's a case, and I've mentioned it, that in looking at these, you also have to look at the writings of those who had no um, involvement either, because that also contrib contributed to how it was remembered as well. And um, so there's a lot more to be unpacked, I suppose, going forward. OK, thank you. Uh, so I'll come to you in just a minute. We have uh, Kiva online. So if you can hear us, just unmute yourself. There we are. Hi, hi. Uh, thanks, Shira. I really enjoyed that talk. Um, and I was going to ask a question about age as a category of analysis, but I think it sounded like somebody had asked that because um, you, I heard you speak in your answer about how some authors come back to it in later life and that's more likely to be men than it is to be women. But maybe connected to that, I mean, c does age matter in terms of how formative the trauma is for the individual? Have you noticed any patterns emerging there? Are younger people more likely to shake it off more easily afterwards or are they more likely to, you know, for to carry it with them for longer? Um, and then sort of connected to that, what role, if any, do you see veterans organisations playing in the in this kind of resurfacing of these civil war narratives? I mean, is that a is that a kind of counter countervailing narrative? Because my understanding of the like the old IRA association and things like that, which start forming and in, in the in the 40s and become stronger again in the 1960s, is that that's a, a that's more pressure to not talk about the Civil War, to talk about the easier old days before before it all went wrong. So but but, but then by the same token, I know that in the Mulcahy papers, for instance, there's lots of records of uh, you know, going over the stories of the treaty split and what happened and why it happened in the way that it did. So what could you say about veterans organizations, kind of in these informal networks that maybe either facilitate or impede the surfacing of these narratives? Yeah, great, Kuba. Thanks. It's two really interesting questions. Um, I suppose the first one, age, does age matter and how formative is it is? I don't think I have a, a straight answer for that because I think it's quite different for different individuals. Um, um, George Lennon is someone who I've addressed and he writes a play in the 50s and then writes his memoir in the 70s. So it was obviously something that he was carrying. He's writing a bit later. And then um, another really fascinating um, testimonial novel is um, Anthony O'Connor's. And he's somewhere in there in 1975. Um, so they seem to be writing about it, first of all, in, in later life. Um, but I can't say whether that was something that the other question is, I don't always know when something was published, when it was written, if it was written earlier or not. And um, so I, I would just say that it obviously depended on different veterans experiencing things differently. Um, and it's often really difficult with trauma to pinpoint the root cause of trauma as well, because I suppose pe people experience a lot of different traumas that might not even be associated with the revolutionary period. And maybe the Civil War becomes a site onto which trauma is projected. But that might be um, other traumas and other personal traumas that are less easy to acknowledge, maybe. In terms of the veterans organizations, um, what I, I suppose I've noticed 
is that there are more test, more autobiographies and memoirs emerging from the 60s. And you're right, they probably are somehow um, spurred on by the um, associations and a number of uh, uh, veterans will say that I wrote this because I was encouraged to by older co colleagues or there's a stronger imperative to, to write about this experience in later life because of the fact that um, the, that I'm the only one I suppose left to testify to this. Um, so th that's definitely something that's come up. In terms of not talking about the Civil War, that's something that is addressed. I'm, I'm thinking of James Comerford's um, Michael Kenny IRA days, and he's referring to the fact that there were all of these tensions about writing about the Civil War because of, of these fallouts that might occur over the Civil War. And that's why definitely some veterans are not writing about the Civil War that they're finishing in, in July 1921. But I think even though that's definitely something that features that there are also a lot of those narratives that do go up into 22 and 23. So um, I don't know if I have solid answers for either of those, but I suppose in terms of age, it, it definitely is an individual question. And absolutely, the veterans organisations would have contributed to some of those more local memoirs that emerge later on. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, I'm going to go to Sean in the room and then we'll go to Guy after. So, I'll just unmute myself. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, two questions really. I mean, the first one is, how far do we have to think about the mechanics of publishing in a relatively small country, which is economically very depressed? Because books and articles have to get published. Um, and we've got to think about how we're addressing this to an Irish audience, or is there a potential Irish American audience, uh, or a, a British audience? Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, for example, if you're going to publish in the Bell, you're dealing with editors who have very strong views. Mm -hmm. they're, going to publish, they're going to like some things and not others. So my first question was, are there institutional factors that will determine what gets published uh, and what doesn't? Uh, the second one was that, you know, listings and various people you're talking about, you do get an impression you're getting a lot more written by the anti-treaty side than by the treaty side. Um, is it the case that the treaty people want to go on uh, mulling over the lost cause? Uh, poor treaty people are more inclined to think it was a dirty job, somebody had to do it, and now it's done, we don't want to go back to it. Uh, in which case, just standing the old cliche in his head, that you're going to end up with a history that's not written by the winners, but it's written by the winner losers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, two great questions. So yeah, I've addressed both of those questions actually in, in the book. So what I've tried to do is address pro and treaty, anti-treaty in every chapter. Um, but there's definitely a case that the what I've I've referred to narrative templates all the way the way through, um, that there were more narrative templates for um, anti treaty Republicans to tap into, that it was easier to place this um as a narrative of redemptive trauma, that this was something um one defeat in a in a larger it was a defeat as a chapter in a larger book. Um and then that these are, are very much open testimonies that are still continuous. Um but then that pro-treaty veterans had much less templates to, at their disposal, so it was much more troubled, you know, so, and Dolan refers to the troubled remembered, so I think that's really fascinating. Um, but nevertheless, I have tried to uncover um, both perspectives, and there's more, I think I came across more, more pro-treaty narratives than I was expecting, um, so I'm, I'm, I think that they are there, but obviously that was more difficult to, to put, put together a narrative. In terms of then the publishing, yeah, it's really important, and it's also a really contested question, because at, at the time in the 1920s and 30s, a lot of these books are being published in from London, that there wasn't necessarily a very strong publishing um, culture in Ireland at the time. And that causes all sorts of debates because there's debates about some of these popular autobiographical novels that are being um, written for English audiences. Um, and there's a concern over that, that these books are written for English audiences and they're, um, that um, I know Ede Blockham, who you might, many of you are familiar with, was very cynical, for example, of Louis Dalton's um, autobiographically inflected novel, um, Death is So Fair, um, and a sense that they, they, they're writing nasty novels about the revolution period for to satisfy an English audience that wouldn't have impressed the more nationalist uh, reviewers in Ireland. Um, and then equally, we, we have someone like Francis Carthy, who publishes with Dent Press in, in London, but is very open about the fact that he's not writing for an English audience and says this in um, public lectures that he it, it disassociates himself um, from that uh, culture of uh, books being published. Um, as for the bell and the f influences, again, 
there's a huge question of can information and the likes of uh, Sean O'Fuelon, because Sean O'Fuelon devises his his canon, I suppose, of the brutal literature of despair, which is um, Sean O'Casey, um, Pallor O'Donnell, um, Frank O'Connor and himself, essentially, um, and very much writes out those that don't fit his model of a, a more romantic disillusion uh, rather than the non-canonical texts, which tend to be a little bit more blunt and maybe more graphic in their violence. So, for example, he's very dismissive of um, Patrick Malloy's Jacket Screen, which he says is is far too brutal um, for his liking. So um, I think that has part, part of the reason as well that he's been written out the canon by these formative figures like Sean O'Fallon. Okay, uh, let's go over to Guy now in his uh, ever impressive digital library. <laughs> Yeah, it's actually a postmodern library. This is a fictional library, and behind it is a real library that looks like that. Now, uh, uh, really, th this was superb. It was really, it was, it was so many challenges were in this paper. I mean, it, it, I really think you've challenged us in so many ways. Um, just the notion of fictionalized testimony and how, definitely for historians, that's a huge challenge for all of us. The whole language of unspeakability and the paradox around that of a language of unspeakability, which is, it's an oxymoron built in itself and the whole notion of a code of silence. And, and it, it really is remarkable. I'm even thinking about Quiva's fantastic question about the veterans because it immediately made me think about Alistair Thompson's Anzac memory book in which he talks about these um, group of veterans in Melbourne who have an alternative memory as they meet every year, which is different from the Anzac myth, except that Quiva made, made me challenge that as well. I mean, it's a whole new concept because a question suggests that maybe, because his concept is what he calls popular memory. The popular memory is something which is contested in a different way. Um, it seems to me that what you're dealing with is unpopular memory. And that's a whole concept which needs to be teased out, how veteran groups work within unpopular memory. And if we're inventing new categories, then I wanted to ask you about a new category which might be coming out of your work. And it's a category that definitely challenges me. And I think it challenges memory studies. And I think it challenges Irish studies at large because we're used to thinking in terms of tradition, right? When we deal with Irish literature, we think of tradition, how people inherit things from each other. It's constantly referring to earlier writers. But in your comment about if we look at this as a, as a century long history, you say there's something which works against tradition because there's this notion that each time a writer comes out and is being acknowledged as the first writer that deals with this issue. So people are not looking back at earlier writers. There's constant breaks. It's, it's forgetting tradition. It's anti-tradition. Uh, and I, that needs to be conceptualized. That's, it's a notion of writers who think that they're reinventing the wheel all the time, and maybe they're not. Maybe they're subconsciously aware of earlier writers. But unlike the tradition in Irish studies to acknowledge earlier writers, that's being effaced. Yeah, thanks a million, Guy. Yeah, no, that's um, yeah, something I've been thinking of more recently, but it is really fascinating. Um, and, you know, you see it in, again and again, so Patrick Malloy writes his novel and he's celebrated as the first novel to write, the first kind of novel from a pro-treaty perspective. Then you have later counts in the 70s again being celebrated as, as the first. And there's an interesting body from the 1990s of, um, Civil War fiction, well, you know, f fiction about the Civil War for children, which is probably what got me reading these works as well, because I was, I suppose, a 90s kid. But I'm um, reading the scholarship on those writings. They're celebrated as the, the first writings to grapple with the memory of the Civil War. And why was it that children's writers were, were picking this up? But actually, it, it's just that all of these, um, I think, uh, and um, to use your own um, terms guide the, the social forgetting and the cultural forgetting of, of, of all these, particularly the cultural forgetting, that they are marginalised then from the canons and um, that they aren't, uh, they're read in their own time, but not necessarily later than that. Um, so it really is quite intriguing that there's these um, writers setting out to contest the silence without being aware of the lineage, I suppose, in which they participate. That's great. Uh, thanks, Guy. Let's go to Marie. So my first question is, is there much difference between what people write in English and Irish 
uh, they may be prepared to write a bit more in Irish, a language that isn't going to be as read as widely. Do either languages experience much dif difficulty with the um, excessive censorship of literature? And then just my other short question was, you told us the Heidi Dolan's family um, had a bit objected to her joining the Methodists. I'm wondering how the Methodists talk about the Lord and Dolan. Yeah, that's brilliant. I know, and I didn't get to talk enough about um, O'Horn and Do Dolan, really. Um, yeah, in terms of English and Irish, um, um, oh, what can I say? Did they get away with more in Irish? They possibly did, actually. And, and um, there's, a, there's a few examples. One of the first, well, what was celebrated as one of the first Civil War uh, accounts or one of the first histories to address the Civil War was um, a story um, called Trothery Nitrate Brugodza, actually. Um, and that, I think it's the 50s or 60s, but that was seen as one of the first histories. Um, so there we have a case of an Irish language text, I suppose, addressing the Civil War. Um, we also have writings by Colm O'Guira, who are writing fiction and um, memoir. And we also have Thomas Barreid as well, who are, again, they're, they are veterans, they're writing in English and Irish. Um, Murray Negrada's collection, I think, is particularly significant because what she is doing in that collection is she is actually um, dismantling revolutionary remembrance and how it's constructed um, and this is by 1939 that she's writing she'd only recently been um expected to retire from her position in the civil service and it's really her, her i've argued that her, her her um short story collection is a real critique of the this this um the construction of this very heroic masculinized um revolutionary discourse um, at the same time, like a lot of these writers, it's, there's a lot of conformism and conservatism balanced in her works. Um, but she managed to, to write this because she was writing in Irish, I think, and it didn't really get, get that much attention. And she probably knew what she was doing. Um, in terms of Marie Negrada, she celebrated for on Shreel in um, the 60s, which addresses the institutionalization of unmarried women. But we can actually see that critique is in her. 1930s works as well, but it wasn't being received at the time. Um, other differences in terms of the Irish and English and how that ties into censorship, it actually comes together nicely. Um, I've discussed one of the first books that was censored um, in the Irish Free State, and that was Sean O'Quivani's um, Fawny, which was a novel that he actually wrote when he was in the Curra, when he was interned. And it was um, censored because of um, a number of passages, I suppose, erotic passages that were essentially celebrations of the, the female protagonist's sexuality and her interest in falling in love. Um, and it was seen, seemed to be um, inappropriate for school children. Um, and that, that was taken. Sean Cotha, yeah. And that was actually removed from the shelves and reprinted. Um, but I have discussed it because it, there is actually a, a scene of sexual violence in that as well. But what's interesting there is that the sexual violence wasn't as problematic as the other accounts of the, the, the women actually being attracted to, to understanding, I suppose, their own sexuality. Um, so that was a, a case of censorship. And then in terms of the other cases of censorship, the censorship that I found is quite uneven, and I suppose that just shows the fact that censorship depended on complaints to the censorship board. So there wasn't necessarily um, a, a, a criteria that you had to fit. Um, but what we do find is that the censorship is generally due to sexual matters that are Is uneven. Catch Malloy's novel was censored um, for references to homosexuality and also to prostitution, but we have other uh, references to prostitution that aren't censored as well. So that's um, where it's not necessarily straightforward. And then um, there was another question. Oh, Eileen. Yes. So, yeah. So um, I think she was very well received. Um, so Eileen um, Dolan came up, so she went to, to London initially. She basically fled from her family home um, in Stony Batter. They had threatened to pass her over to the, the, the local priest, as she writes herself, um, and she fled to London um, where she was taken in. And then she um, came um, up to Belfast where she was a deaconess evangelicist. And she was part of a kind of touring group that traveled across um, uh, various different parishes. And her whole, both O'Horan and Dolan basically gained a reputation for uh, telling their conversion narrative. 
And I think they really did have a huge amount of crowds coming because they were um, telling their stories of how I grew up um, in a Catholic upbringing and um, converted to Methodism. Now, the thing is with the O'Horns is they actually left Methodism in 1930 and then converted um, again and went to, to England. Um, and were, um, So there was, again, a lot of different uh, conversions and a lot of self-exiles and then after O'Hora and died Dolan came back to Ireland and converted back to Catholicism and actually was very closely associated with um, McQuaid so there's you know a lot of um uh, a lot of to be just yeah there you go <laughs> but you yeah I think they're very well received in Belfast Okay, great. Oh, we might have time for maybe one or two more questions if anyone either in the room or online has something they want to ask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, just about the uh, sorry, <laughs> we gave it the last problem. Uh, thank you very much for your paper. Thank you. Um, just about the Irish language question. Um, so you, you had your quotation from Vincent Morley there, mm -hmm. it's a very apt one. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's true for, let's say, it's true for, let's say, 16th and 17th century Ireland, which I know about, as I'm, it's, it's true, I'm sure, as well for 20th century Ireland. In terms of our explanation for why these sources are not talking about historians, um, there seem to be kind of three available ones. Uh, number one, all of these Irish historians are sneaky servants of British imperialism. Which is true. <laughs> uh, number two, these Irish historians are just too stupid uh, to learn a foreign language or learn a difficult language. I don't think that's really true either. I know a lot of very diligent Irish historians. I think the thing is, is the third one, um, historians are trained to write about states cheaply and to use state papers. Um, and I wonder if and they're trying to think about primary sources in a very, very um, sharp, focused way. What is this source of primary source for? Do you find it difficult working with these things, asking yourself what precisely it is these sources are primary for? Are they primary for the memories of an older man in the 1960s in Ireland? Are they primary for the 1920s? How do you cope with that question of their primariness? Mm -hmm. No, uh, um, yeah, that's a very good question. I, um, I suppose in terms of the Irish language period, yeah, I don't, I don't have the answer for that, but there, there's definitely, I suppose from my perspective, um, uh, I'm someone who comes from a, a language background more generally, um, so I, I would see that as something that I, I would do in any context. Um, but in terms of the primary sources, yeah, I think that absolutely you're reading a text in the 1930s it's about the civil war, but filtered through what's happening in the 1930s. And I'm very, very careful to present that in, in any of the discussions of, of these. Um, Francis Carthy's novel, Legion, the Rear Guard, published in 1934. It's just after Fianna Fáil come to power. It's a response to that. And it's a, a plea for reconciliation um, in the context of 1934. Um, equally, when we look at later writings from the 1970s, they are the civil war but filtered through lots of layers of memories and also filtered through what's happening um, in terms of the trouble. So um, that would be definitely how I would see these. And I think that these are not straightforward in terms of what's presented in terms of historical evidence. What's really interesting is how some of them have been misread. Um, so that one example is that the novel by Anthony O'Connor, um, that's really remarkable. He's somewhere in there, 1975. and. Uh, Anthony O'Connor was in the Free State Army, he went on to, to be in the British Army during the Second World War. Um, but in one of the, I think the only considerations of the novel, um, the uh, reviewer equates the protagonist with the author. Um, and I think that that's something to be careful of as well, because even though these are it's testimonial fiction, there's a, we also cannot equate the two. Um, so what I'm suggesting here is that there's maybe an emotional truth, a, a truth that's been conveyed in terms of an experience, but that there's always going to be a gulf between the um, what's fictionalised or what's presented. I think in any even autobiography, there's always going to be a gulf um, between the, the, the eye and the text and the, the, the writer themselves. OK, thanks, Ian. We might take the last question from, from Niall or Neil Murray, uh, who's online. Mm -hmm. Great. Hi. Thanks very much. Uh, like like Marie there, I'm also looking forward very much to the uh, to reading the book. Um, just briefly on the topic that you've kind of covered in some of the answers already, but just on the question of publishers and language. But um, did you do you notice any trend? Were there particular Irish language publishers who were more actively publishing, whether memoirs or works of fiction covering the period? Uh, I'm just conscious that uh, although. Uh, he didn't write about the Civil War period, but um, 
Heather O'Hanrahan, who is an, uh, a County Cork activist, uh, volunteer and uh, journalist. Um, both his both his jail journals, which were re-interment during the War of Independence and uh, post-1916 imprisonment, were published by the Government Publications Office. Now, I don't know if he was ever interned during the Civil War, but I suspect from what you're saying, perhaps the Government Publications Office might have been more reticent to publish it. But anyway, sorry, the, that's more of an observation. The question was about the um, whether there were any particular publishers and who were more inclined to publish those Irish language versions and whether we're aware of any backgrounds that they may or may not have had in revolutionary or other aspects. Thanks. Yeah, Karina Mahad. Thanks, Niall. And I think um, Pather Hanrakhan has a novel as well, a fictionalised uh, novel about the revolutionary period. But yeah, just in terms of the publishing houses in the Irish language, um, it, that is really interesting because there is on Goom, and if we can tell her, if we can tell her, publishes um, Mairead Negrada. But Angoom famously was um, caught up in civil war politics. So the um, shows of um, O'Green and his, his brother Seamus O'Green and Maura um, both worked within Angoom. And I think it was actually a relation of theirs. I, I can't say off the top of my head what relation it was, but they had both been interned um, for anti-treaty activism both in the car. Um, and they both struggled working in the GOOM because they felt that the higher authorities of the GOOM, one of whom was a relation of theirs, were very much of a pro-treaty line. Um, and they felt that that went against them. And also during this period in the early decades of the, the, the state, the Irish language material that was being encouraged was material that would cover the school syllabuses, that there was this sudden sh sh shift to um, teaching Irish across the board in, the school, school, in schools, that that was needed. That's why, essentially, we have the case of Sean Acota's novel being censored, because it needed to be needed to be adapted so that it could be read um, by school children. And then there's also a case where there is this whole board of um, translations, the GOOM have their translation sh scheme during this period where they're getting writers to translate works that you know where Pather O'Donnell's writings are translated from English into Irish but that has, has, was also criticised both at the time and since by writers in that writing wasn't actually being encouraged new writing wasn't being encouraged that it was translations that were being encouraged so we have all these remarkable translations of Black Beauty and 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 uh, Robbie, uh, was it Robert Louis Stevenson and all those, these Treasure Island translations, but maybe not enough uh, first-hand writings at the time. So um, I hope that answers some of it, but there definitely was a lot of politics within those um, those publishing, Irish language publishing right. presses at the time. Great. Thank you, Sergio. That's, that's thank great. Thank, thank, thank you. And, th and thank, uh, uh, thank you, everyone who's, uh, who's been involved uh, this afternoon. It's been a great session. This is obviously uh, extremely important and uh, groundbreaking um, new work uh, by Shifra. Um, uh, it's kind of interdisciplinary Irish studies at, it, at its best. Uh, and uh, I think we're all very excited about um, the book coming out in the new year, um, something to, to look forward to. Um, so can I ask everyone who's still with us to show your appreciation for, for Shifra's presentation by giving her a round of applause.